My name is Sam Vaknin. I'm the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited. The European project, variably known as the European Community or the European Union, is driven by fear, not by promise. It is, and has always been, a phobic, defensive enterprise, rather than a hope-filled polity. Its founders, in the mid-50s, sought to prevent future waves of virulent and aggressive nationalisms. Later, in successive rounds, the framework was reluctantly and grudgingly enlarged to encompass the poorer countries of South Europe and Greece in an attempt to forestall uncontrollable tides of destitute economic immigrants. When communism crumbled, the resulting new and liberated states feared the clutches of a resurgent Russia. The European Union offered enlargement and NATO membership as a solution. Again, it was the dread of an external threat that shaped the bloc, not any overriding vision. More recently, the constituents of the former Yugoslavia and Albania, having endured slaughters and internecine in warfare, and poised as they are on the doorstep of a tranquil and prosperous continent, are blackmailing the European Union into accession. If you do not allow us to exceed these kleptocratic poor imitations of nation-states openly threatened, we will erupt on your threshold and swamp you with blood, refugees, immigrants and crime. And who can resist such an offer? Definitely not the European Union. Pomp and circumstance often disguise a sore lack of substance. The summits of the Central European Initiative are no exception. In November 2002, one such conclave was held in Macedonia's drab capital, Skopje. The delegates included the old chief of state. The congregants discussed their economies in what was presumptuously dubbed by them the small Davos, after the larger and far more important annual get-together in Davos, Switzerland. And the whole exercise rests on a series of politically correct confabulations. To start with, Macedonia, the host, as well as Albania, Bulgaria, Romania, Ukraine and other East European backwaters hardly qualify for the title Central European. Middle Europa is not merely a geographical destination which excludes all but two or three of the participants. It is also a historical, cultural and social entity which comprises the territories of the erstwhile German and especially Austro-Hungarian Habsburg empires. Moreover, the disparity between the countries assembled in the August conference precludes a common label. Slovenia's GDP per capita is seven times Macedonia's. The economies of the Czech Republic, Poland and Hungary are light years removed from those of Yugoslavia or Bulgaria. Nor do these countries attempt real integration, while regional talk shops such as Asian and the African Union did embark on serious efforts to establish customs and currency zones, the countries of Central and Eastern Europe have drifted apart, and intentionally so. Intra-regional trade has declined every single year since 1989. Intra-regional foreign direct investment is almost non-existent. Macedonia's exports to Serbia, its next-door neighbor, amount to merely half its exports to the unwelcoming European Union, and they are declining. Countries from Bulgaria to Russia have shifted 50 to 75 percent of their trade from their traditional Comic-Con partners to the European Union, and to a lesser degree, the Middle East, the Far East, and the United States. Nor do the advanced members of the club fancy a common label. Slovenia abhors its Balkan pedigree. Croatia megalomaniacally considers itself German. The Czechs and the Slovaks regard their communist elopement as said aberration, as do the Hungarians. The Macedonians are not sure whether they are Serbs, Bulgarians or Macedonians. The Moldovans wish they were Romanians. The Romanians secretly wish they were Hungarians. The Austrians are sometimes Germans, sometimes Balkanian. Many Ukrainians and all Belarusians would like to resurrect the evil empire, the USSR. And so this identity crisis affects the European Union. Never has Europe been more fractured. It is now a continent of four speeds. The rich core of the European Union, notably Germany and France, constitutes its engine. The mendicant members from Greece to Portugal enjoy inane dollars of cash from Brussels, but have next to no say 
in union matters. The once Schuin candidates and members since 2004, Poland, Hungary and Czech Republic and maybe Slovakia, they are all frantically distancing themselves from the queue of beggars, migrants and criminals that awaits at the pearly gates of Brussels. The Belgian curtain between Central European candidates and East European aspirants is falling fast and may prove to be far more divisive and effective than anything dreamt up by Stalin. The fourth group comprises even newer members, such as Bulgaria and Romania, and countries such as Macedonia, Albania, Serbia, Bosnia-Herzegovina, and even Croatia. Some of the latter are tainted by war crimes. Others are addicted to donor conferences. Yet others are travesties of the modern nation-state, having been hijacked and subverted by tribal crime gangs. Most of these so-called countries combine all these unpalatable features. Many of these countries possess the dubious distinction of having once been misruled by the sick men of Europe, the Ottoman Empire. In a moment of faux pas honesty, Valéry Giscard d'Estaing, the chairman of the European Union's much-touted constitutional convention, admitted in November 2002 that a European Union with Turkey will, will no longer be either European or United. Imagine how they perceive the likes of Macedonia or Albania, to which they apply the epithet, the Ottoman bloc, behind their backs. As the Union enlarges to the East and South, its character has been and is being transformed. It has become poorer and darker, more prone to crime and corruption, to sudden seasonal surges of immigration, to fractionists and conflict. It is a process of conversion to a truly multi-ethnic and multicultural grouping with a weighty Slav and Christian Orthodox presence. Not necessarily an appetizing prospect to many. The former communist countries in transition are supposed to be miraculously transformed by the accession process. Alas, the indelible pathologies of communism mesh well with Brussels' unmanageable, self-perpetuating and opaque bureaucracy. These mutually enhancing propensities are likely to yield the giant and venal welfare state, with a class of aged citizens in the core countries of the European Union, leaving off the toil of young, mostly Slav laborers in its eastern territories. This is the irony. The European Union is doomed without enlargement. It needs these countries far more than these countries need it. The strategic importance of Western Europe has waned together with the threat posed by the dilapidated Russia. Both South Europe and its northern regions are emerging as pivotal. Enlargement would serve to enhance the dwindling geopolitical relevance of the EU and heal some of the multiple rifts with the United States. But the main benefits to the EU are actually economic. Faced with an inexorably aging population and an unsustainable system of social welfare and retirement benefits, the EU is in dire need of young blood. According to the United Nations Population Division, the EU would need to import 1.6 million migrant workers annually to maintain its current level of working age population, but it would need to absorb almost 40 million new working age immigrants per year just to preserve the stable ratio of workers to pensioners. Eastern Europe, and especially Central Europe, is the EU's natural reservoir of migrant labor. It is ironic that xenophobic and anti-immigration parties hold the balance of power in a continent so dependent on immigration for the survival of its way of life and institutions. The internal common market of the EU has matured. Its growth rate has leveled off, and it has developed a mild case of deflation. In previous centuries, Europe exported its excess labor and surplus capacity to its colonies, an economic system known at the time as mercantilism. The markets of Central, Southern and Eastern Europe, West Europe's hinterland, are replete with abundant raw materials and dirt cheap, though well-educated, although indolent and well-trained, labor. As indigenous purchasing power increases, the demand for consumer goods and services will expand. Thus, enlargement candidates can act both as a sink for Europe's production and the root of its competitive advantage. Moreover, the sheer weight of their agricultural sector and the backwardness of their infrastructure can force a reluctant EU to reform its inanely bloated farm and regional aid subsidies. 
notably the common agricultural policy, that the EU cannot afford to treat the candidates to dollops of subventionary largesse as it does the likes of France, Spain, Portugal and Greece is indisputable. But even a much debated phase-in period of 10 years would burden the EU's budget. And the patience of its member states and denizens is running very low. They, it is on the verge of an acrimonious breaking point. The countries of Central and Eastern Europe are new consumption and investment markets. With a total of 300 million people, Russia counted, they equal the EU's population, though not its much uh, larger purchasing power. These countries in the periphery, east, south, are likely to while the next few decades on a steep growth curve, catching up with the West. Their proximity to the EU makes them ideal customers for the EU's goods and services. They could provide the impetus for a renewed golden age of European economic expansion. Central and Eastern Europe also provide a natural land nexus between West Europe and Asia and the Middle East. As China and India grow in economic and geopolitical importance, an enlarged Europe will find itself in the profitable role of an intermediary between East and West. The wide-ranging benefits to the EU of enlargement are clear. What do the candidate states stand to gain from their accession? The answer is surprisingly little. All of them already enjoy to varying degrees unfettered, largely duty-free access to the EU. To belong, a few, like Estonia, would have to dismantle a much-admired edifice of economic liberalism. Most of them would have to erect barriers to trade and the free movement of labor and capital where none exist. All of them would be forced to encumber their fragile econo economies with tens of thousands of pages of prohibitively costly labor, intellectual property, rights, financial and environmental regulations, sanitary requirements, and so on and so forth. None of these countries stands to enjoy the same benefits as do and did the more veteran uh, members notably in agriculture and regional development funds. Joining the EU would deliver rude economic and political shocks to the candidate countries. A brutal and rather sudden introduction of competition in hitherto much sheltered sectors of the economy, giving up recently hard-won sovereignty, shouldering the debilitating cost of the implementation of reams of guidelines, statutes, laws, decrees and directives, and being largely powerless to influence policy outcomes, all these are huge costs to pay. Faced with such a predicament, some countries may even reconsider. No wonder the EU is very unpopular with its own citizens.